me if you would. I'll be reading this morning from Luke 14, beginning in verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported those things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, then go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. It ends with a strong warning. And so as we attempt to understand it, may we be faithful. We look for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to help us understand, and to apply as is appropriate to our life. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are uh, rapidly approaching the end of football season, as most of you know. Um, the beginning of football season, however, I have to tell a story. I think John and Carolyn Sutter aren't here this morning, so I can tell this on them. Carolyn here? All right, she'll, she'll confirm for me. John turned on the first game of the year, was about to turn on the first game of the year. He had the TV set all ready to go. He turned to Carolyn and he said, is there anything you want to say before the season begins? <laughs> so, um, sometimes we're like that, right? Now that's a story, it's not really true. John wouldn't do that. And if he did, Carolyn would straighten him out quickly, I'm sure. <laughs> but some of us are that way, I think, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Some, many people who think they are heaven bound are saying that to Jesus. They're saying to Jesus, Jesus, is there anything you'd like to say before I get on with my life, which is over here, which doesn't really include you? And the fact is, there's a lot Jesus would like to say, and it's in our passage this morning. We've still got Jesus at lunch. We will have him done by next week. He's at lunch with this Pharisee. He has spoken of various things there, including their, all of it trying to point them toward their need for a savior. Of course, they're not having any of this. One of the men has responded by saying, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, implying, well, we'll be there, but we're not so sure that you will be there. But he knows that the Bible likens the kingdom of heaven to a banquet, a banquet to end all banquets. Jesus, however, wants to warn him there may be one less there than he thinks. And so he uses this parable to do that, a couple of parables here, and he's, he's teaching us the humility that's required for repentance. The humility to humble ourselves under what the meaning of the kingdom of God is all about. So we began to look at that last week, and we looked, first of all, that we have to humble ourselves under the phasing of the kingdom, meaning we'd like it to all happen right now. We'd like, just as the Pharisees certainly anticipated and expected, to see Jesus the Messiah come and begin his kingdom now. But Jesus is teaching that while his kingdom begins in hearts now, it begins in our hearts now, since the time that Jesus came, this has been true, it has its final fulfillment. It plays out in history later, yet to come. 
be under Christ's rule of perfection at his second coming. We have to humble ourselves under that expectation. Secondly, we have to humble ourselves under the pricelessness of the kingdom. We have to come to an understanding that no price we could ever pay could deflect God's justifiable wrath against the sin that's a part of us, both by our birth and by the way that we act. Nothing we could do could take care of that. But what God demands, God supplies. What God demands, God supplies. That's the story of the gospel, beloved. That's why you hear me say it every once in a while. What God demands, God provides. And so our invitation to the kingdom is based on the death, resurrection, and the ascension of Christ all on our behalf to allow us to have the possibility of forgiveness. It takes humility, however, to come to the point where we understand I can't do it, Jesus already did it, and so I accept that, the pricelessness of the kingdom. So let's move on today to the final two points relative to this. The third point, we have to humble ourselves under the priority of the kingdom, under the priority of the kingdom. Notice verse 17 again, at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. So you may remember last time we talked about the fact that they had this kind of twofold invitation system in those days, whereby first of all, a banquet would be announced Kind of a, will you come when the banquet is ready? And people would respond and say, yes, I want to come. I'll be there. But now when it's actually announced, it's ready. Today's the day or tomorrow is the day. The second phase of the invitation, these people are ready with excuses just coming out of the woodwork. I I know I said I'd come, but I I can't come. Got a new field, new oxen, new wife. I can't come. It's an amazing turn, is it not? A feast like this one for people in that day could have been the kind of the event of a lifetime to to be invited to a feast of somebody who had the money and the resources to put on this kind of feast would have been a, a highlight of someone's life. It'd be like inviting, getting invited to the White House and turning down that invitation. Some of you might, I understand, but I, you, you get the point. <laughs> Getting invited to the White House and you turn down the invitation. Not only would it be offensive to the president, but you would miss out on something very special. And so here come the excuses and they are so flimsy. I've bought a field and so I can't come. Really? I mean, you, you bought a field without examining it first as though that would actually be true. You can tell these are all just excuses, right? I bought, a, I, I bought a, a, a yoke of oxen and I have to go examine them. And it'd be like, you know, Lynn and Dan or Mike buying a new John Deere and saying, oh, I got to go examine it as though they would buy the tractor unseen and wouldn't go see it first. Of course they would. I've got a new wife and I can't come. Really? You're ashamed to bring your wife. You can't bring your wife to the banquet. Excuses make no sense. They are trivial. And they rightfully offend the master of the banquet who has carefully prepared this feast for these people. So so that's the parable. Okay, so what point is Jesus making here? If, If the master is God the Father, if the servant who is doing the inviting is God the Son, is Jesus, if the banquet is the kingdom of God or heaven. And if those invited are initially the Jewish people, and then by application, all of us, then what's the point? (coughs) I want to suggest three things that I think are seen here that support this point that we have to humble ourselves under the priority of the kingdom. The first is the kingdom is ready. The banquet is ready. Now, 
the full expression of the kingdom is not, but all that is required for entrance into the kingdom, all that's required for us to become an invitee and to become a participant and member of the kingdom of God is available. We don't merit the invitation. It comes to us by grace. It's an invitation that's bought and paid for by Jesus Christ, but it's available now. And we can enter the kingdom now. It just takes the humility of repentance to get there. But now is the time. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, you remember the passage, he says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The day of salvation is now. The invitation is now. The preparation has already been made. The time is now. John says in John 5, 24, a verse many of you perhaps memorized as children, truly, truly. Always be aware when there's two trulys, right? It means this is really important. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He doesn't say will have sometime in the future. He doesn't say down the road you'll get this when you die. He says you already have eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. The kingdom, beloved, is now. Phase one, the rulership of God in the hearts of people who are responsive to his message is now. And so now is the time. Second thing we see here is that the giving of these lame excuses is by people who are not totally antagonistic to the, to the kingdom. In fact, they've said initially when the first phase of the invitation came out, yeah, I, I, I want to be part of the kingdom. I want to come. They're, these are not the people who say, oh, Christianity is a bunch of bunk. Don't believe anything about it. These are people who said, yeah, I, I, I'd like to, I think I'd like to come. We might call them conditional acceptors. They want the kingdom. They start out believing. They start out saying, sure, count me in. I'll be there. But in the end, they don't come. In the end, they get distracted. In the end, they're waiting for something. They're waiting to get through this. They're waiting to experience that. They're waiting to sow their wild oats, as they used to say in the old days. They're waiting to do something. They want to complete their own agenda before they really make a commitment to Christ. And so they're not really antagonistic. They just want to pursue their own ends. But in the end, they don't come. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And unfortunately, some of us who are even here this morning are probably living out this tragedy because the bottom line at the bottom of our heart is that me is more important than he. Me is more important than he. And it can't be that way. That's not saving faith, beloved. It's something else. It's an interest. It's not antagonism. It's fooling ourselves, but it's not saving faith. Jesus described these people earlier in Luke chapter 8. You may remember when he told the parable of the sower. Remember that? And the, the guy goes out and he sows the seed in the field. And the seed that he sows is the word of God. And he talks about three different kinds of soil there that the seed lands on. And the third type of soil is a type of soil that has a lot of weeds in it. And so the seed falls on that ground, but it gets choked out before it can mature, before it can bear fruit. It gets choked out by all the weeds that are growing stronger than the seed is. And Jesus interprets that for us in chapter 8, verse 14. He says this, he says, And as for the wheat that fell among the thorns, those are they who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures. Those don't sound like things that would choke you, right? Those don't sound like good things. But Jesus is saying, no, to the extent that they choke out my word in your life, to the extent that they keep you from a living, loving commitment and relationship with me, to that extent they are choking you out of life. What are they again? The cares, the riches, the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. 
It's exactly who Jesus is talking about in this parable as well. These are not flaming unbelievers. They want the kingdom of God, but they want the kingdom of self more. It's a big test. They're, they're more taken by this world than they are the next. The cares and the pleasures and the hobbies and the recreations and all of this stuff of life mean more to them than the kingdom of God does. So these are not necessarily, uh, there's another class that's out there that doesn't care at all, but these are ones who at least on the surface look like they care. But there's a third point that the Lord is making here. The third point which is that this is a really stupid decision. <laughs> this is a really stupid decision to reject the Lord. To say, yeah, I went in, but I, the price seems a little high right now. I'll come back later after I've completed the things that I want to do. I'll, I'll just put this on hold for a while. The decision to let the hold of the world be stronger on our life than is the call of God is a really nearsighted, stupid decision. That's what Jesus is trying to teach here. It doesn't look stupid to us, see, but he's trying to show us, but it really is. This is like getting an invitation instead of the White House. Let's use the, the wedding of Kate and uh, what's his name? William, William, right? William and Kate. So you get an invitation to the wedding, right? And you send back a reply that says, oh, sorry, I can't make it. I have a haircut that day. <laughs> would you do that? That would be stupid, wouldn't it? D do you see, that's why Jesus is using this kind of excuse in this parable. He's doing this on purpose. He's trying to let us see. He's trying to reveal to us what we don't see naturally. Naturally, it looks like to pursue my own ambition as my highest priority, to, to pursue this relationship as my highest priority, to pursue the getting of money as my highest priority, to do that as my highest priority, it doesn't look stupid, it seems like a wise thing to do. And Jesus is saying, no, in light of eternity, you're gonna see the way you're living your life is really stupid. You're spending it on trivialities. You're wasting your life. You say, but I have to make a living. I have to have ambition. I have to get out and prove myself. Of course, beloved. We're not saying you shouldn't do these things. We're saying, where do they, where do they fall on the spectrum of what's important to you? Where do they, what would your life say? If somebody looked at your life, what does your life communicate to them? What's most important? Is it your education? Is it your sports? Is it your hobby? Is it your recreation? Is it your, what is it that's most important? That's what Jesus is trying to get us to see because if people wouldn't look at you and say, yeah, I, I think Jesus is really important to that person. I think they really care about the Lord. Then the likelihood is that you are spending your time and your precious life that the Lord is giving you in a way that is very foolish, perhaps to the point of not even being part of the kingdom of God. The postponing of the decision to accept the invitation of Jesus to let him be your Lord and Savior, the putting it off, the rejecting of him is really a stupid decision. We can be doing the same thing and just not understand it, but the reason he uses these kind of excuses is, here to, is to help, help us see that. It's the same principle he's teaching in Matthew 6, 33. You know, we all know the verse, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to you. And what are all those other things? Well, if you look in that chapter, you'll find out they're all the things of life. They're the making of a living. They're the working. They're the ambitions. They are the pleasures. All of those things, he says, I'll add them to you. He's not saying they're not important. He says they have to be second place. Jesus will not play second fiddle to the trivialities of life. Cannot say, I want you, but I want this more. So you'll have to take your place over here, somewhere else in my life. December 29th. 1972, <clears throat> flight 401 
from New York to Miami was a, a Lockheed 1011. And it's a, it's a wide body. Any of you ever ridden in it? It was one of the most, I, I love those planes about as good as any. Wonderfully comfortable planes. But this plane was flying from Miami to, from DC, from uh, New York City to Miami. But as they approached the landing in Miami, this little, and the, and the pilot put down the landing gear, this little light came on. The light indicated the landing gear has not deployed. Well, that raised the temperature in the cabin a little bit, right, as you would expect. And so the pilot immediately pulled up, got into a holding pattern so they could investigate this and find out. They immediately realized it could be that there was just a short in the system of some kind and that the landing gear had really deployed, but it was just the light bulb was faulty. So they sent the flight engineer down below deck where he can investigate that possibility. Meantime, the co-pilot began to look at the little light that was on and he began to investigate, is this thing really plugged in correctly or not? Is there something going on with that? The pilot put the plane on autopilot and then he began to investigate with the co-pilot this little light that's in the cabin. So before long, you had the pilot and the co-pilot spending their whole time looking at the little light trying to figure out is it working or is it not. You got the flight engineer below deck investigating down there and what nobody noticed was that the autopilot began slowly to descend and nobody caught it. The last thing, the last words that were heard out of that cabin was the pilot saying, what's going on here? And then there was dead silence because the plane had crashed into the Everglades. It was the first crash in the United States of a jumbo jet, 101 people killed. 260 injured, amazing that any were still alive. But all because the pilots were distracted by a little 75 cent light bulb. Distractions can be deadly, beloved. You say, how foolish. But see, what Jesus is saying is no more foolish than to have somebody wake up one day in eternity and find out they spent their whole life on, 70, on, on what in eternity's values are 75 cent light bulbs. The pursuit of money, the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of all these things that are good in their own right, but they're just 75 cent deals. The real value in life, the pricelessness in life is to know Jesus. That has eternal merit and eternal worth. And it's not going to be long. For most of us sitting here today, 20, 30, 40 years, we'll be there in eternity. <coughs> we'll have joined our friends. And the things that we think are so important that we have number one on the list, we will see were so trivial. To come to Christ, beloved, does make a difference. Your priorities do change. Probably haven't really come to him if that's not true. We have to realize that to come to Christ might make it harder to make as much money as we think we need or want. Possibly. It's not that there aren't rich Christians, but the priorities change. It may not be as important. We may not have as many friends or the same friends. We may find that some of the pleasures we thought were good we really don't need or they need to fall off because they're not really godly ones in the first place. But the day will come when we will see all of these as trivial in light of eternity. And the question is, where will we be when we make that discovery? It'll be too late then to make any changes. The invitation is now. That's what Jesus is trying to get across to those who are spending their time on 75 cent light bulbs trying to earn their way. The excuses will look very flimsy in eternity. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, put first things first and we get the second things thrown in. That's pretty much Matthew 6.33, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Put first things first, and we get the second things thrown in. Put second things first, then we lose both the first and the second things. It's true. So we have to humble ourselves into the priority of the kingdom. The fourth thing I see here is that we have to humble ourselves into the proliferation of the kingdom. What do you mean by that? It means you're going to be joined by a lot of people, some of whom you may think you like, some of whom you don't think you like, some of whom you think you're better than, some of whom you may think are a little better than you, but most of us have a lot more kind of under than over. And Jesus is saying, no, you're on the same boat. There's going to be a lot of people there that you didn't think were going to make it. And you need to realize that, and you need to live in the good of it, because I love them all. The kingdom is open to all. 
Look how the servant goes out and he reports these excuses. So the master is angry and he says, go invite everybody. And they say, well, go and invite you know, the, the, the lame and the poor and the crippled. And, and, and they say, we've done that. See, Jesus is aiming this, this aims right between the eyes of the Pharisees. Because what Jesus is basically implying by this parable is that these who thought they had a lock on the kingdom of God because of who they are and what they're doing aren't even gonna be there. Instead, there are gonna be these, these other ones who are lame and blind and halt. The master is rightfully angry. He says, go invite the others. How could these that had worked at it so hard not be in? How could these who were outwardly so good that the, that the people all around them looked up to them and said they are godly people, how could they not be in? Think about this for a moment. R.A. Torrey told the story one time. He was, he was an evangelist, early 20th century evangelist. Somebody brought a friend to him one time and they talked for a moment and then Tori said to the friend, because he figured this was the reason he'd be brought, he said, are you, he said, are you a Christian? And the friend says, oh yes, yes. I was brought up a Christian. I was reared to, 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 uh, to love Christ. And he said, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. That was the training of my parents. Tori says, well, have you been, but have you been born again? And the man said, he said, said, what? And Tori said, have you been born again? Because Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you been born again? And the man said, I, well, born again? I, I never heard about that. I don't know about that. I, I, I don't know about born again. So Tori said to him, well, then you've committed the greatest sin that a man can commit. That sort of brought a halt to the conversation, right? And the guy thought about it. He says, he says well, what do you mean? He says, that's, that's a pretty big accusation to make. He says, I've not committed the greatest sin that a man can commit. I have been faithful to what I, what I was raised to be. I've lived an exemplary life. Ask my friends, ask my family, ask anybody. I have lived a good life. I have not committed the greatest sin a man could ever commit, never. Tori said, well, what do you think that sin is? He said, murder. So Tori said, I want you to read a passage here. It's in Matthew 22. And so he turned to Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38, and he had him read it. Here's what he read. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. It was in the King James. That's what the only Bible they had in those days. In English, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So Tori said, which commandment is this? And the man said, well, it's the first and greatest. He said, well, if that's the first and greatest commandment, what's the greatest sin? He said, well, I guess the greatest sin would be not to keep this commandment. So Tori said, well, have you kept it? Can you honestly say you have loved the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? Has God been first in your business? God first in your family. God first in your pleasures. God first in every decision you make. God first in your hobbies. God first in your recreation. Has it been God first in everything? The man was honest enough to say, no, sir, I, I, I can't say that. He said, well, what have you done? Well, I've broken this commandment. He said, which commandment is it? The greatest commandment. So what have you done? I've committed the greatest sin that a man can commit. I didn't see it. Until now. Beloved, rejecting Christ is the greatest sin. It, it's beyond murder. It's beyond child molestation. It's beyond anything you can imagine to reject Jesus. Because why? Think about it. The Father has prepared the banquet. What did it cost him to prepare the banquet? It cost him to send his own son to become a man. It cost that son to die on the cross. It cost that son to be separated from him. Infinite beings being separated, infinite time in a moment of time from a human perspective, suffering the devastation of the hell that should be ours in order that we can be invited to the banquet and that we can come for free. And you think something else is worse than turning down the invitation? Not even close. 
That should tell us several things. It should tell us, number one, that no sin is too great to be covered by the blood of Christ. But it tells us, secondly, why it is such a devastating thing to turn down the invitation. It's the worst sin a person can commit. There are consequences. Notice the next step in verse 21. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. So the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly in the streets and the lanes and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said, go in the highways and hedges and compel the people to come and fill my house. This was a devastating ending for the Pharisees. The reason it was so devastating is it basically was saying that they who thought they had a lock on the kingdom, sorry, you're not going to be there. Your goodness isn't good enough. That was bad enough, but then he's implying next that the lame, the halt, the blind, and the people that can't see are going to be there, the poor. You see, all of those people, the Pharisees had already categorized in their theological system as the reason those people are blind and can't see and the reason they're lame and can't walk and the reason that they are poor and don't have anything is because of their sin. And Jesus is saying, oh no, they're going to be there and you're not. Do you see why this was so? He's hitting them right between the eyes. They will be there. You will not. And then it got worse. Because then he says, he sends the servant further to the outside of the city, which symbolically meant the Gentiles. That was unthinkable to these Jewish people, that the Gentiles would be included in this. And it says they are compelled to come in. Compelled, why? Because they couldn't possibly believe that this was for them as well. And so they are compelled to come in, but come they do, and by grace they are all welcome. All can receive eternal life. There's no discrimination in the offer of salvation that comes from Christ. The problem is, it's all sinners. The problem is, it's only the repentant sinners that are there. Only repentant sinners who have humbled themselves under the regulations of the kingdom can come in. And so they are repentant. These who come, or the Pharisees here, are representative of the educa educated and the influential in society, the powerful people who find any religion preferable to Christianity. Christianity says you are hopelessly lost. You, are, you know, this is a tough message in our politically incorrect day, or politically correct day. You are hopelessly lost. You are hopelessly in your sin without hope before a God who is absolutely perfect. But you may come, you may come by receiving the salvation that's been bought and paid for by his son. What God demands, God supplies. If you will just accept it, you can come that way. People don't want to do that. Every religion says, no, you have the power within. You can save yourself. Just try harder. Just do more. Just follow these rules. Just be on this path. Just do this. And you can be saved. <clears throat> That's why the gospel is so humbling. It reminds you that you cannot do this on your own. You must come. You must come by the way of faith. You must come as a repentant sinner. And that's why there will be Muslims in heaven. Because they're repentant. There will be those from the dark alleys and the, and the, and the dark ways and the dark streets who will be there because they have repented of their sin. There will be drug dealers and there will be prostitutes and there will be potheads who will be there in heaven. Some of you are saying, I'm not sure I want to go. Oh, but, but we do, right? I want to be with the repentant, saved ones. There will be those from every tribe and language and people and nation according to Revelation 5.9. All equally saved by the blood of of the Lord Jesus Christ, all equally sinners, just like we are, all equally repentant, just like I trust we are, and all equally saved by him. They will all be there, but the question is, will you be there? Are you coming by humbling yourselves under the requirements of the kingdom of God? A few years ago, 1981, there was a guy named uh, Stephen... Judy, he was a murderer, serial murderer, 
rapist had been caught in Indiana. He was on the death row and he became the first person executed in Indiana for I, I forget, 50 years or something like that. And shortly after that execution, uh, a team of people went in from the prison fellowship, Chuck Colson's uh, organization at that time, and they went in to preach at that at that prison, and the report that Colson gave said, you know, the prison was on edge. He said it always is after, after an execution like that and where one hadn't happened for years, you could only imagine what it was like. But he said the message from whoever was preaching that day as an evangelist from somewhere outside was very powerful. And the men were responsive. And at the end of the service, they had time where they could go meet with some of the men. And some of the men who were on death row even were allowed out of their cells to visit briefly with, with the evangelists and with some of those who had come along with him. And so they talked to these men individually. And then one of these men whose name was James Brewer was walked back to his cell by one of the volunteers. And then the prison officials came through and they said, okay, it's time to go. You guys have to go. And so the evangelist is trying to get his volunteers out and he goes into this cell where Brewer and this other man are standing and he says... Guys, I'm sorry, but it's time to go. And the volunteer looked at him and said, hang on. He said, please, this is very important. He said, my name is Judge Clement. He said, I'm the one who sentenced this man to death because of what he did. But he said, this man has come to faith in Christ. This man has given his, his heart to the Lord and he's born again and we need a minute just to pray together. Well, there's, no greater, there's no greater picture of the gospel than that, of the inclusiveness of the kingdom of God. It's not about who you are or where you were born or what you can do. It's about what Jesus already did. And so here stand these two men, you know, one black, one white, one rich, one poor, one who was going to go home, one who was going to go to his death shortly, one rich, one poor. Well, what did they have in common? They're going to be in heaven together. because they're part of the kingdom of God because they've come in the same basic way. So my question this morning, have you humbled yourself under the phasing and under the pricelessness and under the priority and under the proliferation of the kingdom? Have you seen that it's all about repentance and the things of this life that could be so distracting you're determined to leave behind as a priority? That the priority will be Jesus in your life. You will confess, as Paul said with your mouth, Jesus as Lord. That means boss. That means number one. That means in charge. So you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, because if you will, you will be saved. So on another day, April 22nd, 2002, we lived in a, in a place in Yorba Linda up on a hillside when we were in California, and down below, I don't know, half, half a mile, three quarters of a mile away, was a railroad track. And on that day in 2002, death came to that railroad track. A mile-long freight train ran through a stop sign uh, on the railroad track and crashed headlong into a commuter train. Two people were killed, 26, or 260 others were injured as a result of that. You know what they found? That, you know what the cause was? You can probably guess. The guy that was the engineer of the freight train was texting. Didn't see the stop signal. Ran right through it. And by the way, he was one of the ones who was killed. Distractions, beloved, are deadly even in this life. But imagine what it's like to arrive in eternity one day and find out you spent your whole, whatever God gave you, 80, 70, 60 years of life pursuing the things that were long gone. And now all of eternity stretches out ahead and you weren't ready. Jesus is the answer, but he's the only answer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your invitation. Thank you that the invitation is now. Thank you that we have the warnings from Paul and others that we dare not wait. We must come now. We dare not be distracted and put other things above you in our life. Lord, if we could only, if we could only see, you know, it's not like you're trying to take all the joy out of our life. I, I trust that those of us who, are, who have made the determination long ago to let you be number one in our life and who are 
we're certainly not perfect at that, but the de determination is there. The heart has turned toward you. The repentance has been there. We could testify, look, the, the joy is far greater on this side than it is on the other side. There's joy for this life and there's joy for the life to come. What you give is always far more than what you require. So help us to see the flimsiness of the excuses that keep us from faith in Christ and help us to grab on as hard as we can as your spirit gives us the faith and the grace to do so. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.